maybe this system of alliance is brilliant or insane. At least for a while, when I say a while, it's a hundred years. These alliances do provide security. Because like we were talking about yesterday and even today, with the biggest powers of Europe all lied together, no one would be dumb enough to attack the other side. No one would have the, what it takes to actually begin a war of this magnitude. Until it happens. We were talking yesterday about how there's a famous quote that says, if anything's going to upset the balance of power, it's going to be because of some fool in the Balkans. It's correct. We're going to see a 19-year-old make a choice that changes the world. Now, I do, I, I start this in such a way because I want you just to think, just to kind of picture in your mind, in your lifetime, who would you say is one person that has changed the world more than anyone else, just in your lifetime? If I think about my lifetime, because the dinosaurs were over here, it's kind of hard to think about who is most impactful. But the thing is, humanity has this thing about it. It's just in our minds, it's our psychology. We have a hard time kind of thinking about one person changing the world. It just doesn't register. We compartmentalize things. We want it to be much bigger. We want it to have its hand all over the world. We want it to be something where we can say, one person can't do that. It has to be a country, it has to be an entity, it has to be something. We're gonna see one person cause World War I, which causes World War II, which causes the Cold War. One person, indirectly, will probably cause about 160 million people to die. And if it wasn't for this one person, Adolf Hitler wouldn't have risen to power. He would have been an artist. One person changes the world. Now, this happens to be maybe the ugliest assassination in the history of the world. And of course, it has to take place in the Balkan Peninsula. Southeastern Europe, as we talked about earlier, has a bit of a problem. It's made up of multiple small countries. Countries that are very much on the menu of Europe's biggest powers. They all have interests there. Now, we were talking very early on when we first started this about Serbia. Serbia has this very much nervousness to it. And they should be nervous. They have been eyed as the next expansion of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They should be nervous because they are on the menu. The Balkans is considered to be the powder keg of Europe, where it just needs a small spark to explode and burn all of Europe with it. We're gonna see this one small spark take place as the heir to the Austria-Hungary throne is gonna go on a public relations tour. Now, Austria-Hungary had recently expanded. Just a few years before, they annexed Bosnia into the empire. They gobble up a small neighbor. Now, the reigning emperor of Austria-Hungary is Franz Joseph I. He's been the emperor for roughly 60 years. He is very much a tough and very old-school thinking kind of emperor. His nephew is going to take over. It will take place. And his nephew has a different way of thinking about being the emperor. His nephew, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, 
is very much a progressive thinker. He's considerably more liberal than his uncle is. And he thinks when I take over, I'm going to run the empire in a very different way. He's going to go to Bosnia. He goes to Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia, on this public relations tour in June of 1914. Now, he's going to Bosnia basically to say, I'm going to be your biggest fan. I'm going to treat you very equally and fairly. We're all going to prosper. The Bosnians really have their best ally coming to see them. But how do the Bosnians see the emperor or the heir to the throne? Do they really trust him, do you think? Is he really the symbol of power and oppression? To make matters even worse, he goes to Bosnia on perhaps the worst anniversary possible. It's the equivalent of having a celebration in the United States on September 11th. He goes to Bosnia and says, I want everyone to see me. We need a parade. And I'm going to run the parade route in an open convertible. Does anyone else see a problem here? <laughs> There's way too much access. This is a bad idea. To make matters even worse, let's print the parade route in the newspaper. There's a group of people who's been waiting for an opportunity. A group of Serbian nationalists where one person's freedom fighter is another person's terrorist. There is a group of young Serbians called the Black Hand who believe that it's time to strike, to be certain that they are no longer on the menu. They want to assassinate the heir to the throne. There are six Serbians, 19 and 20 year olds, in a bar waiting for their right moment, waiting for the call to come. Within this bar, there's a person who just drops off a newspaper at their table and walks away. Now, we're not 100% certain who this person was or what their role was, but a lot of people say it was probably a member of the Serbian government, that they are almost the puppet masters pulling the strings of these 19 and 20 year olds. One of these 19 year olds picks up the newspaper, opens it up and there's a code inside and he just says, gentlemen, today's the day. They set up perhaps the worst assassination ever, but it's well thought out. It's well planned. But the way that it's done is so clumsy and sloppy, it's as if fate is guiding them. They have it set up where they have plan A, plan B, C, and D. They set up four assassins along the parade routes. The first assassin is stationed, and they can point to it on the map. You'll be here. Your job is to shoot the Archduke when his car arrives. Here comes the Archduke down the parade rounds. Assassin A loses his nerve. He goes and gets a sandwich. Here comes the parade coming down the route, and Assassin B says, I guess Assassin A didn't work out. It's up to me. He is a bomb. This bomb, he is going to see it as the Archduke is coming down the parade route. He lights the bomb and he throws it into the open convertible with maybe the perfect shot. So perfect, it bounces off the Archduke's seat, out of the car, and rolls under one of the cars next to it and explodes. Now, for the Archduke, should he be a little nervous now? Yeah, he should be. He simply says, what just happened? What took place? Is anyone hurt? 
there are a handful of people that are hurt and they're taken to the hospital. And the Archduke just says, on with the parade. Parade continues. Assassin C sees the Archduke coming down the parade route. He says, I guess A and B failed, it's up to me. He pulls out his gun and it misfires. So he does what he's supposed to do. Again, this is the plan. He takes a cyanide capsule, swallows it, and jumps off the bridge to the river below. The river below is six inches deep. He's found by an angry mob, and the cyanide capsule doesn't work. He simply throws up violently as the crowd drags him out of the river and beats him mercilessly. Here we are. The assassins have failed, but it's not over yet. The Archduke will continue on the parade route to City Hall where he is scheduled to make a speech. He goes to the mayor of Sarajevo and says, are there assassins all over the city? What's going on? And the mayor just looks back at him and he says, Archduke, do you really think there are assassins throughout Sarajevo? This is kind of the weird thing because there are assassins all over Sarajevo. The Archduke and his wife get back in the car and the Archduke tells the driver, we need to go to the hospital. We're going to go and visit the people that were injured in the first attack take us to the hospital. But the driver doesn't really know exactly where he is. He was taught to go on the parade route. And he says, Archduke, that's off the parade route. What do you mean? He says, we're at the parade route. We're going to the hospital. So the driver puts the car to drive. He's turning around, puts it in reverse, backs it up. Goes back and drive, turns around, and the car stalls in front of a sandwich shop. When the first assassin, by sheer happenstance, walks out of the shop and his target is sitting right in front of him. Never, ever does it happen that an assassin gets two tries at his target, as if the hand of destiny is guiding this whole thing. He pulls out a gun, he shoots the Archduke, he shoots his wife, and Gavrilo Princip, a 19-year-old, changes the world. The Archduke and his wife are going to die at the hand of this 19-year-old when Austria-Hungary is going to give Serbia an ultimatum. They give them a choice, but the, ult excuse me, the ultimatum is fantastic. You can never accept it. Can't do it. It's basically apologize. You're coming into the empire, and we are going to annihilate you. Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia. Who's promised to back Serbia? Russia. Russia declares war on Austria-Hungary. Who's promised to back Austria-Hungary? Germany. Germany. Hang on, don't back up just yet. Germany declares war on Russia. Who's promised to back up Russia? France. France. Great Britain. They all declare war on each other. This network of alliances that was designed to protect Europe has now brought it to the absolute worst case scenario. All of the alliances kick in and the biggest powers in the world are now all at war with each other. This is going to be cataclysmic.